Hello, sort of a new location here. Um, normally I make these videos while my two-year-old's sleeping at nap. Um, but I'm trying to catch up on some uh, missed opportunities for re video recordings. So I'm just standing in another part of the house and he's sort of running around. Hopefully this will <laughs> not be too distracting for me or for you. So today we're starting into a sort of trilogy of videos looking at the question of how to read and understand the Bible. This obviously is a huge subject and um, yeah, much much ink has been spilled, many videos have been made and blogs have been written. Um, I, mean, I something I got into a lot myself and when I first started blogging. Um, but now it's time to make a little set of videos about this. So we're going to be going through it in three parts. Uh, the methodology of you know just how to read the Bible on a practical level. Then we'll get into some interpretation, and then I'll uh, do a third one to to follow up to deal with a bit more the question of of how we work through theology from reading and while reading the scriptures. Um, so you know we'll, we'll build this up over time. Right now we're just doing the basic start methodology: how to read the Bible. Uh, drawing from the Anglican tradition, uh, I found a very helpful way to explain uh, two approaches to reading the Bible here. Um, in the prayer book tradition, we have two lectionaries. We often talk about the lectionary, but we really have two. We have the daily office lectionary, and we have the communion lectionary. <sighs> and the daily office lectionary is the one where we basically do the Bible in a year. This is the style that evangelical Protestantism is the most familiar with and the most used to. We, in our daily office lectionaries, have never completely read the Bible cover to cover. We've always left something out. Parts of the Torah, you know, some of those additional chapters of laws that are less readily useful to the Christian today. The original lectionary left out Revelation and much of Ezekiel tended to be omitted. Back in the day, it's first and second chronicles, usually omitted. Um, but the lectionary, that daily lectionary, has been revised a number of times, and so it, uh, you can find different versions of it. And many people have made their own homebrews as well, um, their own their own compilations. Like, well, I would, I, I want a version without the apocrypha because I don't like the Anglican formularies, so they go off and make their own. Or, um, well, I want one that gets every chapter of the books of Moses because I like the laws in Leviticus. It's like, okay, well, okay. So there are tons of tons and tons of versions. It gets a little complicated. But the idea is that you're reading chapter by chapter, book by book through the course of the Bible and covering basically the whole thing. And in so doing, you get the grand sweep of scripture every year. This sort of supports a more historical approach to the scriptures, trying to get the sense of the story, trying to get the sense of chronology, trying to get the sense of the, the basic literal meaning, what is going on here, and how does, you know, how does it proceed from one to another. Um, different lectionaries have different uh, you know, approaches to how this is ordered. Some are very simple, some are more complicated. Um, I think a good way of contrasting it would be to compare the 1662, the original lectionary, um, which is actually not printed in most 1662 prayer books anymore because they have an eight, a 19th century and a 20th century one in there as well. Um, but you can you know, you can poke around online. The original is very simple, and then compare that with, say, the 1928 prayer book in the United States of America, and that daily lectionary is very complicated. It's tied to the liturgical calendar, and you're jumping from one book to another in, in a very different order. They're trying to tie it to the liturgical calendar, so it's more thematic. Um, it works. You get a lot of the Bible out of it, but in general, the newer the lectionary, the less Bible you get. Um, I think the 2019 prayer book is the one that finally bucked the trend and gone back to something much simpler and that's something that covers a lot more of the scriptures. So if you want a simple daily office lectionary to start off with, definitely go with our new prayer book 2019. So that's one method of reading the Bible, and it's um, 
easier and the most familiar to most evangelicals and Protestants. But the second approach to reading the scriptures is represented in the communion lectionary. This is for Sunday communions and uh, holy other holy days and feast days throughout the year. In that, we're not reading the scriptures consecutively week by week or holiday by holiday. Instead, we're reading select scriptures that are paired together to explain a doctrine or other teaching um, either you know something about the life of Jesus or something about the gospel narratives unfolding or just about the Christian life in general, depending on the occasion or the season. So where in the daily office lectionary, you're just reading consecutively, you know, some Old Testament and some New Testament over, you know, the course of the whole year, um, both old and new each day. So you're never completely you know, bogged down in one place um, without any respite. Um, the, the communion lectionary. Um, just gives you two, re well, historically gives you two readings, usually an epistle with a gospel reading, to tell you something about Jesus and something about the gospel. Um, modern communion lectionaries are very different, and there's a bit more of an attempt to be more consecutive week by week, um, but you still get some of that old school pairing ideas where you're taking usually in the modern lectionaries, the gospel lesson and the Old Testament lesson work together somehow. The Old Testament foreshadows or um, sets the grounds for what you see in the gospel lesson. So that's how the modern communion lectionaries tend to work. And on special occasions, the high holidays and feast days and other special occasions, the epistle lesson will also feed into that uh, theme of the day. Um, so what you then get is a way of reading the Bible that helps you connect the dots from one thing to another and something that helps you to read them in a different way. Perhaps the easiest examples for this would be um, Palm Sunday and Christmas Day. On Christmas Day we hear well, around Christmas Day, we hear tons of Old Testament lessons. If you've ever listened to Handel's Messiah, almost all of its text is Old Testament. It tells the story of Jesus with a string of Old Testament quotes, which is pretty amazing to the modern reader's perspective because we're used to you know, a very basic literal reading where if you want to read about Jesus, you read the Gospels, and it's as simple as that. But on Christmas, we read things like, um, and his name shall be, you know, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. And, you know, yes, that's Isaiah prophesying about the coming Messiah. But if you read that in its own context, you might not catch that very easily. Uh, similarly, if you look at the classic from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, about uh, the virgin shall conceive and, and give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, if you put that back into its, co its context of the whole chapter, it's being given to a, this, this, that prophecy is being given, being given to a very specific king under very specific circumstances, which again, if you try and read it in a strictly historical context mentality, you're going you're to have a much harder time noticing that it's actually pointing to Jesus. Um, I mean, as a, as a young adult, the first time I managed to read the Bible all the way through, uh, I, I was going ch literally chapter by chapter through the Old Testament, and I missed so many references to Jesus because of the way I was reading it. Sorry about that glitch there. Uh, but when you read something like that, you know, the, the, the virgin shall give birth, you read something like that on Christmas or very close to Christmas Day, and, and suddenly just the context of the holiday makes it super obvious. Hey, this is a prophecy about Jesus. You can do the same kind of thing with Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, the suffering servant songs. Um, when when we read about uh, he was wounded for his tr for our transgressions or wound you know, wounded for our sins pierced for our transgressions and all that wonderful stuff. Um, again, reading that in context as you go through it, 
it might not be clear what Isaiah is talking about. And indeed, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts uh, is reading from that part of Isaiah and is honestly confused. And he asks, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or somebody else? And, you know, the modern Christian reader looks at that question and says, what is wrong with this Ethiopian guy? It's obviously about Jesus. But if you're reading it in its strictly historical context, it's not as clear. If you're just going through Isaiah chapter by chapter, it, it's not as obvious. When you take that passage and you read it on Palm Sunday, alongside the narrative of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, then it's super obvious. And of course, the New Testament uh, in, in, in several epistles make reference to that text in Isaiah to describe or refer back to the crucifixion of Jesus. So the New Testament, the, the Bible itself, teaches us to use this reading or interpretive method with the Old Testament. After all, Jesus says, all of the scriptures, you know, the writing, the prophets, the writings, um, you know, the law, the prophets, the writings, refer to me and, and refer to, to, the, to this gospel of, of his birth, life, resurrection, well, death and resurrection. So as Christians, we read the Bible with an eye to its historical context, but also to its Christological context context. What does it tell us about Jesus? What does it tell us about the gospel? And so that's why we have two different ways of reading the scriptures. We have one that is chapter by chapter, more historical, more narrative focused. And we have another way of reading the scripture, which is more um, topical, doesn't, doesn't quite get, doesn't quite capture it. Um, Christological, really, Christ-centered. Um, we, we take scripture readings together and use scripture to interpret scripture. This is not some weird, crazy Catholic thing. This is not some way out there allegorical concept. This is how the Bible teaches us to read it. You know, when you read the epistles in particular, St. Paul and St. Peter and the others are using the Old Testament to explain the new. The book of Hebrews in particular is a tour de force on this just expositing Old Testament text after Old Testament text, pointing it all to Jesus, his gospel, his sacrifice, his high priesthood, uh, the liturgy and sacrifice that he has administered. So it's a very, very helpful book to read uh, to understand what this method of reading the scriptures is all about. So that's our two uh, methods of reading the Bible that are very helpful. One where you're just reading the Bible, uh, you know, as its text presents it, and one where you're reading the Bible as its theology, as its contents presents itself. That's one of the great things about being in the liturgical tradition. We have access to, not only to reading the Bible like any like anyone in the world, al almost anyone in the world does, um, but we also have access to this liturgical tradition where we have these historic pairings of scripture readings that help us to understand the Bible, understand the gospel and the faith of Christ in much deeper and richer ways. Um, I'll, I'll just close with a personal anecdote to this, to this effect. Um, when I was, be be shortly before I got married and joined the Anglican Church, I was doing some of my mentored ministry towards becoming a pastor uh, at a congregational church. And I was, a couple years had gone by, so I was preaching, you know, every few months or so. And I got to do Palm Sunday one year, my last year there. So I preached not on the crucifixion of Christ, not on any of those, you know, gospel sequence of events leading up to his death, I preached Psalm 118. Uh, Psalm 118 is the 
typical psalm, or at least parts of it, that are that is used in both Palm Sunday and Easter Easter Day, um, in in a lot of lectionaries, and I used the psalm to proclaim the gospel, particularly of um, you know the the death and resurrection of Jesus, and people's minds were blown. People were blown away in, 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 a, in, in a wonderful way. They had never heard the Psalms opened up like that before. And even the, yeah, and, and the pastor didn't tell me off either. He didn't tell me I was being some crazy Catholic. Um, it was just um, a, an approach that he wasn't familiar with, but he appreciated it. And everyone, uh, well, maybe they were grumblers who, who didn't talk to me, but um, it was a wonderful testament to the fact that when you read the scriptures with a Christ-centered um, approach, it's very, very fruitful. And you can proclaim the gospel from almost any text of the Bible, even when it doesn't, um, in historical context, necessarily seem to suggest itself that way. So that's why we have these two lectionary approaches, these two reading approaches toward the Bible, which give us two interpretive approaches as a result, and yet they're complementary. They work together to proclaim one complete faith. So hopefully that's a helpful introduction to the methodology of reading the Bible and uh, something that you can explore with a prayer book or other liturgical resource and you know, enrich your experience of the Bible because both of these styles are very important. Um, different traditions sometimes lean too heavily in one way or the other. Most Protestants, like where I grew up, are totally about reading the Bible, you know, historically uh, in that context, and 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 miss a lot when they forget about what the liturgy has to offer. And then there are you know people of a more you know, Roman or other sort of Catholic mentality who only. Or, or, or almost only ever hear the Bible in the context of the Mass or something, where they get the scriptures that are sort of, that appear cherry picked, even though there's usually good reason they're matched together, but they don't learn how it all fits together in the continuous story. So the Bible just remains this mysterious, poof, look at this stuff that works. Uh, and I, well, that's complicated. No idea how that happened. I guess I'll just let the priest handle it. And so you get a different kind of problem. Um, so when you put these two to back together, you get a wonderful enriching experience of the Bible, the word of God, for which I can only ever say thanks be to God.